In this video, I will derive C sub V, the heat capacity under constant volume condition for a system given its partition function. In an isochoric process, there is no volume change, there is no expansion work. Therefore, the change of the internal energy of the system originates solely from heat. And therefore, we have du equals dqv. This q stands for heat. And then cv equals dqv over dt. That's the definition of the heat capacity. And then we replace dqv with du. And in a different video, we derived the expression of the internal energy u in terms of the partition function q. It's nRT times dLnQ over dLnT. Over here, this Q is the partition function. And then we use the product rule. We have this nR times this part, plus nRT times the derivative of this part. And therefore, we get the, something like this. And then remember, dLnT divided by dt equals 1 over t. Therefore, we can have this t over dt being transformed into dLnT. Therefore, we have this kind of expression, and they have a common factor nR, so we have this nR here. So it's going to be nR times the sum of two terms. The first term is the first derivative of LnQ with respect to LnT. The second term is the second derivative of LnQ over LnT. So it's fairly easy to memorize. Again, the first and second derivatives of LnQ with respect to L and T. Therefore, the molar heat capacity is this. We divide both sides by N. We have CVM, the molar heat capacity, under the constant volume condition, uh, is R times, again, the first and the second derivative of L and Q with respect to L and T. <coughs> For ideal gas, uh, the translational partition function is 2 pi M kVT over H squared. I'm sorry about missing this uh, squared here, so I just uh, fix this part. Uh, to the power of uh, 3 halves times V, and then we, ha we can see that the logarithm of this translational partition function uh, does depend on L and T, and the first derivative is simply 3 halves. So I'll get this uh, partition function of translation being fixed. All right, and then the translational heat capacity is uh, this uh, molar heat capacity of translation is three halves r, three halves r, under the constant volume condition. Now let's look at the uh, rotational heat capacity. For a linear molecule, uh, the rotational partition function is kBT over sigma hCb. Sigma is the rotational symmetry number, and B is the rotational constant. But anyway, this part does not matter. L and Q is equal to L and T plus a constant. Therefore, this derivative is simply 1, and then we plug in this 1 here. And of course, the second derivative of L and Q now becomes 0. Therefore, the CVM of the rotational mode of the linear molecule is simply R. For a nonlinear molecule, uh, I'm not going to give you the full expression, but I can tell you this uh, rotational partition function is proportional to t to the power of uh, 3 halves. And then we take the logarithm of this, and then we have uh, 3 halves here. We plug it in here, and the derivative of this 3 halves is 0. Therefore, the rotational molar heat capacity of a nonlinear molecule is 3 halves of R. That, that does make sense. If you have a linear molecule, there are actually only two rotation modes. When you have a nonlinear molecule, you have three rotation modes. Therefore, you have 2 times 1 half of R. Over here, you have 3 times 1 half of R here. Now, for a harmonic oscillator, the partition function is more complicated. It's e to the power of negative half h nu beta over 1 minus e to the power of h nu beta. Nu is the vibrational frequency, and beta is 1 over kBT. So first, we can just take the logarithm of both sides, and we can uh, have this expression here. ln q equals negative half h nu beta minus ln of 1 minus e to the power of negative, e to the power of negative uh, h nu beta. And uh, naturally, we want to uh, do some variable substitution. 
So that's what we did here. We set z equals h nu beta. And then uh, this will become much simpler if we replace h nu beta with z. Also, if we look at d l n t, it's negative d l n k b z over h nu. And again, we're talking about the uh, exact differential. So this part is simply just negative d l n z. So what happens to this l n k b h nu? It does not depend on, uh, it's a constant. Therefore, it disappears. It's the exact differential of a constant integer. And then for convenience, um, hereafter, we're going to just uh, replace this Q vibration with simply just Q. The, uh, uh, this Q stands for the partition function of vibration. And then we'll have to evaluate the first derivative of L and Q with respect to L and T. Why? Because again, we have this equation for the molar heat capacity here. We'll simply just evaluate the first derivative of L and Q with respect to L and T, and then the second derivative. And we're going to sum it up. We'll get this CVM. So let's look at the first derivative here. And again, we replace this H nu beta with Z. So over here, it's going to be negative half Z minus L and 1 minus E to the power negative Z. That's what you are looking at here. And then L and T is negative D L and Z. So you see a negative sign here. And then uh, dl and z is uh, uh, actually just uh, dz over z. So we just do another transformation. So we uh, change this to be dz over z. And then we have z being here. And this negative sign, this negative sign, or this negative sign, they cancel. So I ha we have positive signs here. And then it's easy to evaluate the first derivative of this guy. It's just half and then times z here. And then the, this second part is z times the first derivative of this, and then we have this e to the power of negative z over 1 minus e to the power of negative z. You need to be able to use the chain rule in calculus. And then we combine these two terms, and then we do some uh, uh, simplification. In the end, the first derivative is 1 half times z times e to the power of z plus 1 divided by e to the power of z minus 1. So it's not too bad. And then we're going to do the second derivative. The second derivative is the first derivative of this guy. So we plug it in here over d l and t. And again, d l and t is negative d l and z. So we're going to do this. And again, d l and z equals d z over z. So again, we're going to just uh, replace d l and z with d z over z. And we flip this z up. And now we have negative half. So the half is from here, negative half z. And then we need to uh, get the first derivative of this guy. And again, we use the product rule. The first derivative of z is 1. So we just copy this part here times negative half z. So negative half z times this part. And then negative half z times z over, over here. We just uh, copy this z here. And we have z squared. And then we need to uh, take the first derivative of this fraction, e to the power of z plus 1, divided by e to the power of z minus 1. How do we do that? Again, we have to uh, kind of use uh, the quotient rule in calculus, and then over here, this is a quotient rule. We simplify this, we get negative 2 times e to the power of z over e to the power of z minus 1 squared. So over here, this is the result. And then we plug this back into here and do some simplification. We somehow can kind of just combine these two terms. In the end, this 2, the sum of this 2 is z squared times e to the power of z over e to the power of z minus 1 squared. So it's not too bad. And now we have the vibrational molar heat capacity of a harmonic oscillator. CVM vibration equals R, the ideal gas constant, times z squared times e to the power of z over e to the power of z minus 1 squared. So what is z? Again, z is h nu beta. z is h nu over kBT. Uh, so when z approaches infinity, when temperature approaches 0, and this e to the power of z approaches infinity really fast. And uh, this CVM is approximately just r times z squared over e to the power of z. And again, e to the power of z increases much faster than z to the power of 2 when z approaches infinity. So in the end, the molar heat capacity of the vibration is 0 when the temperature is very low. How about high temperatures? When temperature is very high, z approaches 0. And again, uh, we have this expression. Now we can use Taylor expansion for this e to the power of z. The Taylor expansion of e to the power of z is 1 plus z. 
and e to the power of z is approximately zero, uh, 1 on top, and z squared and z squared cancel. So overall, we, we can tell that at a very high temperature, uh, when z approaches 0, we have the molar uh, heat capacity of the vibration to be just uh, simply R. Again, uh, this entails uh, KBT to be much greater than H nu. All right, now I'm going to give you two real examples. Why is HCl? Why is uh, this uh, adding to a molecule? For HCl, Z equals H nu beta equals H nu KBT. So uh, what's the wave number of HCl vibration? It's roughly 2900. What's the wave number of uh, KBT at the room temperature? It's roughly 207 uh, wave numbers. So you do the division and get roughly 14. So Z is roughly 14. Now we just plug in this uh, Z equals 14 in this expression of the vibration molar heat capacity on a constant volume. And we plug it in and you can tell this uh, e to the power of 14 is huge and this part and this part partially cancel and then you're looking at 14 squared over e to the power of 14 it's roughly zero so this vibrational heat capacity is roughly zero we predict the molar heat capacity of HCl under constant volume condition is just a 2.5 R 1.5 from the translation one from rotation and our prediction is 20.8 joule mol k. What is the experimental data? 20.8 joule mol k. Exactly the same. Now let's look at the iodine 2 gas. Iodine 2 has a very small uh, vibrational frequency because iodine 2 uh, is heavy. It has a, a very large reduced mass and a very small uh, force constant. Uh, the wave number of iodine 2 gas is roughly 126 wave numbers. Compared to KBT at the room temperature, the ratio is uh, roughly 0.61, and this Z is roughly 0.61. It's, it's smaller than 1, and now we're going to plug in this Z value again into the equation of the vibrational heat capacity here. So it's Z squared times E to the power of Z divided by E to the power of Z minus 1 squared. And then uh, times R. Again, this is a translational heat capacity. This is a rotational heat capacity. This is vibrational heat capacity. So in this case, the vibrational heat capacity is significant. It's 0 0.97 R. And then we sum it up, we get uh, uh, roughly 28.8 joule per mole K. So compare this HCl 20.8, uh, iodine 2 28.8. So we have uh, uh, a much uh, a significantly larger uh, molar heat capacity for iodine 2 because again iodine 2 has a much smaller wave number than HCl. So what is the experimental data? 28.6. So it's pretty close.